Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs here, and today we're going to be talking about foods that you should avoid if you have thyroid disease. In other words, these are foods and food groups that you should not be eating if you have any sort of thyroid problem. Um, and first I want to tell you that there's a downloadable PDF copy of the information that we're going to be talking about here. I'll put the link in the description so that you can download this and have this on hand. You can print it out, put it on your fridge, or put it somewhere where you can see it frequently to remind you. So let's talk about these things. We'll go into some more detail. And if you want more detail, you can always come back into this direct blog post as well because there will be information in here that I just can't cover. So number one, uh, the number one food group to avoid, not necessarily in terms of importance, by the way, but just number one that we're talking about, uh, is sugar and especially refined sugar. Now, most of you know uh, that you shouldn't be eating a copious amount of sugar, right? This shouldn't come as a revelation to you. Um, but part of the reason for that is that sugar, when consumed, um, can cause specific issues and disruption to certain hormones in your body, specifically insulin, and it can lead to insulin resistance and, of course, weight gain. Now, what you may not realize is that there is a bi-directional relationship between your hormone insulin and thyroid function or thyroid disease in your body in such a way that if you have insulin resistance, it can worsen or cause existing thyroid dysfunction, but then also thyroid dysfunction can cause wor and, uh, worsen insulin resistance as well. So that's why it's bi-directional and can go both ways. Beyond that relationship, uh, sugar, especially excessive sugar in intake, can cause issues like um, can exacerbate food cravings or cause sugar cravings. It can exacerbate or cause depression. It can cause gut-related issues as well. Um, it can feed certain bad bacteria in your gut and cause them to proliferate, which can cause other diseases and so on. So there's a number of reasons that you want to avoid sugar or at least reduce it. Now, one thing I will say also is that... Um, there are certain types of people, um, especially along, you know, depending on certain factors like their um, metabolic system and their weight, uh, and what the differences between these individuals will allow some people to consume more sugar than others. Okay, so this can kind of be confusing for some individuals because they see other people eating sugar. They're like, well, if they're having some, maybe I can too. Um, but as a general rule, what I would suggest to you is that if you are somebody who is overweight, um, and just trying to lose weight, or especially if you have insulin resistance, you are going to be one of those individuals that should probably eliminate sugar almost completely or as close to 0% as you possibly can. Once your metabolics and your insulin uh, improves and or once your weight normalizes, then you can probably consume um, more sugar at that point. But um, the amount of sugar that you consume based off of those issues, for instance, let's put it this way. If you're someone who is 50 pounds overweight and you're, and there's someone who is 50 pounds overweight and someone who has normal weight, if they both eat the same amount of sugar, it's not going to impact them both in the same way. So just be vigilant about that. If you're someone that's overweight or has insulin resistance, you'll want to consume less sugar. Number two um, is gluten. And if you see an asterisk here, uh, if you're watching the video, you'll see an asterisk. Uh, what that means is that there's other considerations to take into account um, on these food groups. So gluten is definitely one of those. Now, the general reason that I recommend you consider avoiding gluten, and this is not a hard and a fast rule, is that most people who have thyroid disease have the autoimmune condition uh, known as Hashimoto's thyroiditis or autoimmune thyroiditis. And we know well, and, and at baseline, we know that that is an autoimmune disease. Now, um, another fact we know is that celiac disease is another autoimmune disease. And we know that people who have one autoimmune disease have a much higher incidence of developing a second one compared to the normal population. So just by virtue of having an autoimmune disease, which most thyroid patients do, that's going to predispose you to developing another one. And we know as well that up to 2 to 5% of people with autoimmune thyroiditis or Hashimoto's thyroiditis develop uh, celiac disease. So that's a fairly high amount. But you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's 1 out of 50 to you know, 1 out of 20. That's not a ton. That's not a huge amount, right? It's not like 80% of you. Um, so why would I recommend, recommend against it? Well, that's just the autoimmune component. It doesn't take into account other formulations or, or, of gluten sensitivity, such as non-celiac gluten sensitivity, or NCGS. Now, these are people that don't have the autoimmune component, but they still have an intolerance to gluten. And so in my experience, there's the, a large portion of people that have thyroid disease, whether they have Hashimoto's or not, have one of those two problems. They either have celiac disease or they have NCGS. Um, and the bottom line is they don't tolerate gluten very well. What's interesting, though, is that not everybody fits into this category. There are some people with thyroid disease who can consume gluten, and they do it just fine. It also depends on the source and a number of other factors, which is why I said this has a little more detail we're not going to get into. But something you should definitely consider eliminating is gluten at least for a short period of time. 
Number three on this list is dairy. And again, this has another asterisk here, uh, just so you know. Um, but one of the reasons why you may want to uh, get rid of dairy is, be, well, two main reasons here. Number one is you may have a condition called lactose intolerance, which means that you don't respond very well to the sugar, which is found in milk and dairy products, and that's called lactose. So if you're lactose intolerant, you just, you're just intolerant to that sugar. But another reason that you may not tolerate dairy is because you might be intolerant or sensitive to other proteins found within dairy, such as casein. And it seems that these proteins may cause a different set of reactions which are unrelated to those people who have lactose intolerance. Um, and this is highlighted in a study that was back in 2014, which showed specifically that Hashimoto's patients who avoided dairy for a total of eight weeks notice a reduction in their TSH. And what that means, uh, I'll just extrapolate that out, but what it means is those people who eliminated dairy saw a natural improvement in their thyroid function without doing anything else. So that's what that reduction in their TSH means. Because if your TSH, TSH reduces, that means your body's able to produce more thyroid hormone naturally. So this is actually a really interesting thing. So what it tells me is that there's something that the dairy is doing for a lot of patients, at least enough that this was significantly, um, or this was, um, they found a, a significant correlation in these patients, um, was that those people who eliminated dairy, probably the dairy was doing something in their intestinal tract, which was limiting uh, thyroid function's ability in some way. That could have been conversion, that could have been um, production. We're not really sure because they didn't go into detail, but we do know that if a lot of people who eliminated it saw some benefit. So that's why I'm putting this in here. And then you'll notice that there's a large percentage of people who are just lactose intolerant, which may not cause the same issues as a casein intolerance does, but still it's not something that you want to continually put in your body, especially if you're resistant or if you're having an intolerance to it. Next one on the list is alcohol. So this one shouldn't come as a surprise, um, but alcohol, we know that it's, it's cytotoxic to certain cells in your body. That includes a uh, certain thyroid cells, but it also includes liver cells as well, which is probably what most people know about. Um, but what's another interesting fact is that alcohol can inhibit uh, the release of TSH and TRH, which are the pituitary and hypothalamic hormones, which help control your thyroid. So when you consume alcohol, it suppresses your brain's ability to tell your thyroid to produce more thyroid hormone. And so that's one element. And then also it can be toxic to the cells inside your body um, in your thyroid and actually kill them. So for that reason, I say just avoid alcohol 100% if you have any sort of thyroid disease. Next one on the list is trans fat. This is another one we probably shouldn't have to talk too much about because you probably just know that trans fat is not something you want to consume. And chances are pretty high that you're not consuming it already because if you see trans fat on anything, you want to avoid it. Um, but the reason for that is um, high fat diets or the reason I'm talking about it in relation to your thyroid is that some studies show that high fat diets can cause thyroid dysfunction and some of those fats include uh, the fats like trans fat. So that's why that's included here. Um, the next on the list is industrial seed oils and fats. So these are um, a group of what's known as partially hydrogenated vegetable oils or PHVOs for short. And it's a whole list of these, these, um, uh, these fats. And the problem with these fats is that they can trigger an inflammatory state in your body. And these are highly processed. Um, they go through multiple steps to be created and they're really usually cheap oils and they're used often in um, fast food restaurants and they're used in highly processed food and things like that because they're just so cheap. It allows the people who produce these foods to keep the price very low. Now it comes at a cost though. So even though you're, you're saving some money when you purchase it, it's not doing any benefit for your body and it may be triggering inflammation. Now, inflammation is important to us, or especially those people that have thyroid issues, because any inflammation blocks the conversion of T4 to T3. So if you're consuming these sort of fats, even though they're cheap, they may be um, limiting your body's ability to utilize thyroid hormone. That could be the thyroid hormone that your body is producing naturally, but it could also be thyroid hormone that you're getting from thyroid medications that you're taking orally or that you're ingesting in your body. So next one on the list, highly processed soy. This is another one that has an asterisk here. Um, and the reason for that is this. So soy um, has, when we look at it conceptually or from a theoretical standpoint, um, there are two main ways that soy can impact your thyroid uh, negatively. Number one is that it can potentially inhibit or block the uptake of iodine into your thyroid gland. Okay, so it's goitrogenic in that way. But also it can limit your body's ability to absorb thyroid medication. So if you take or if you're consuming soy products, especially those highly processed soy products, um, before and you're, or you're taking thyroid medication, if you consume the soy, it might block your body's natural ability to absorb the thyroid medication that you're taking. Obviously, that's unwanted and that will lead to, you know, some side effects because 
the, the dose that you're taking is going to be variable. It might go up and down. Your TSH might change as well. Just not a situation you want to be in. Now, the problem with that is some other studies show that even though what I just said is true from a theoretical standpoint, it may not be seen clinically in every single person which means that there's probably some group of people who are really sensitive to soy and some group of people who are not. And so because it's really hard to parse out the difference between those two groups of people, we don't really have any factors that distinguish them. What I generally recommend is just get rid of the soy products because generally they're highly processed and they're not something that you should be consuming anyway. They often have, um, you know, those inflammatory fats that we talked about previously. So if you avoid them from your diet, I find from my experience that many people tend to improve. But there are some conflicting studies on the matter. So you know, you kind of have to figure it out on your own. I can't really tell you for sure. That's why there's this little asterisk here. Next on the list is uh, frozen and highly processed foods. Um, so that includes anything in this category would include things that are uh, meals that are produced, which, you know, are laden with a lot of preservatives or other chemicals, which allow the food to last longer than it would than it should otherwise, right? So that's what I mean by frozen and highly processed food. So uh, I'm trying to think of the name of those things. Um, TV dinner, stuff like that, right? So a lot of frozen things like that are the things you should avoid. Now, the reason for that is these preservatives and chemicals that are built within the food, um, they're there to make the food last longer. But the problem is if you consume those chemicals, some of those have been shown to negatively interact with your thyroid and cause dysfunction. And so, again, this is one of those things where people tend to be, some people tend to be more sensitive than others, and we don't have a way to figure out who's sensitive and who isn't. But in general, it's way healthier and better for you to consume whole foods than it is frozen and highly processed foods. So I think that kind of goes without saying, and here's the reason and logic as to why. Um, this doesn't include um, frozen vegetables. A lot of frozen vegetables can be very healthy um, because especially if they're flash frozen right when they're um, harvested, they can retain a lot of their nutrients. So that doesn't necessarily include those. Um, but what I'm talking about specifically would be like those TV dinners and so on. Next on the list would be legumes and beans. So legumes and beans, um, this is another asterisk one just so you know if you're listening to this, but um, legumes, and, legumes and beans have naturally occurring substance, substances inside of them such as goitrogens and lectins. And goitrogens we talked about before, these are the substances that can block iodine from getting into your thyroid gland, which is obviously not ideal. And then lectins can cause a lot of other cellular issues as well, including gut dysfunction, and they can attach onto other cells and uh, interfere with immune function and so on. So the combination of these two things, goitrogens and lectins, which are found abundantly in legumes and beans, um, are one of the reasons why or that I recommend against consuming these at least in large quantities if you have thyroid disease. Now the reason for the asterisks is that some people can tolerate legumes and beans better than other people. And so it's one of those things where you're going to have to probably figure this out on your own through it, an element of trial and error to see how your body reacts. Now I will tell you that in my experience, most thyroid patients who also have intestinal issues tend to not tolerate these uh, this, these foods, so the legumes and the beans. So any sort of intestinal issue, which includes irritable bowel syndrome or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or inflammatory bowel disease or acid reflux, any of these underlying intestinal issues, they may predispose you to a sensitivity to this group because it, they're kind of hard for your um, intestines to break down. And they can also promote the growth of certain potentially um, pathogenic bacteria in your GI tract. So because there's a, a lot of potential uh, reasons to avoid them, and I can't think of a ton of good reasons to consume them, I generally recommend that you avoid those if you have thyroid disease. But like always, you got to kind of have to figure out what works for yourself. I believe this was the last one on the list, and this is coffee. So this is probably going to maybe come as a, a shock, or maybe not to some of you, um, but let me explain why coffee is probably not a good thing to consume if you have thyroid disease. So there are, have been some studies that show that consumption of coffee, if you, let's say you take coffee first thing in the morning, um, coffee will cause some minor TSH suppression, which TSH again is the hormone that is produced from your brain, which tells your thyroid gland to produce more hormone. So after you consume coffee, there is some suppression in, um, in these, these brain uh, produced hormones. But that uh, reduction is also associated with a decline in both T3 and T4 levels. So this is a temporary thing because obviously it goes away after a while, but the pro but that's one uh, potential reason that you would want to avoid um, consuming coffee if you have thyroid disease. Another reason would be that a lot of people that I find consume coffee tend to consume it because they're, they're compensating for some other problem in their life, such as fatigue or low energy. Now, fatigue or low energy can come from your thyroid for sure, but can also come from issues such as lack of sleep or overstressing or overexerting your body 
um, which may lead to things like adrenal fatigue. So what I see in a lot of patients is that they start off with a little bit of coffee, let's say one cup, with, then that you know kind of gives them a boost and they can get through the day and do their work. And then eventually that's not sufficient. So then they go to two cups or three cups or four cups or whatever, and they just slowly build up. And they're consuming more and more coffee to, to be functioning throughout the day. And that comes at a cost of overtaxing the body, but also potentially reducing thyroid function in the process. And that's definitely not something you want. So in theory, there may be some benefits to consuming coffee, including, you know, um, anti-inflammatory benefits and maybe um, perhaps some benefit from the caffeine. But that assumes that you're using it correctly, that you're somebody who processes caffeine appropriately, and you're somebody who does not have thyroid disease. Now, if you don't fit into any of those categories, it's probably a good idea to avoid it. And my recommendation to eliminate it completely, especially if you have any of the symptoms of adrenal fatigue. So anyway, this is a longer video than normal, and we went over quite a bit here. Um, and again, if you want to take a look, you can look at the blog post here, which is where it's at, but you can also download um, a PDF file, which includes all this information in one spot, so that, again, that you can put it on your fridge or refer to it as, as necessary, you know, whenever you need to as necessary. Um, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer the, these questions. But remember, your diet is going to be highly individualized to you which means that these are general guidelines, but they you don't necessarily or have to follow them exactly as I've outlined them here because you might be able to tolerate some soy or some gluten or things like that. So you're going to have to play around with it. It's going to take some trial and error. But leave any questions you have below, and otherwise I will see you guys in the next one.